The White Pill is available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us a special returning guest, my buddy Jack Basobic. He is senior editor of Human Events and hosts the Human Events Daily podcast, which is massively successful, far more than this train wreck of a show. Uh, Jack, after I booked you to be on this week, you were the, um, I'll, let's use the word recipient, target, uh, victim, hero, of a hit piece by The Guardian, everyone's favorite, uh, most reliable um, outlet from overseas. The headline says, it's all about trolling, uh, how far-right influencers are shaping Republican narrative. L let's just start from the, just start, let's just even start there. Do you consider yourself to be far-right, and what do you think that term means? I mean, it's it's really amazing when you see these pejoratives be thrown around. So what I think of is... They came up with the term far right because they had to describe somebody who was a Trump supporter that came up in 2016, but wasn't sort of a not even necessarily a doctrinaire conservative, but somebody who was around in the sort of conservative pundit space before 2016. So you'll notice this in media that most of the time when they're trying to differentiate between the two. So we just say new right because we're looking for a term to differentiate the two that some pundit who came out prior to 2016 will always be concerned uh, will always be described as political or you know political conservative conservative commentator but anyone after that who came up after 2016 that was explicitly pro trump or just in that 2016 milieu is is it's always far right hard right extreme right um, I think somebody wrote a book about new right, but it was not very well received. And, and so, you know, nobody, you know, it totally fell flat on its face. I don't know who would, who would spend their entire time DOA, about that. It was called totally DOA, just absolutely DOA. And, and even though it, it as a term of art, it actually makes sense if you're trying yeah. to understand it from a categorical perspective, but in terms of any sort of, you know, political spectrum, it, you know, it make, obviously makes no sense when you try to speak about it in those terms. Um, it's, it's really kind of fascinating because the, the, you're the central figure in this article. Um, I don't think you would claim that you are the most important person, um, framing Republican or conservative thought, although this article, <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's kind of weird to have it be that way. If anyone, I mean, who would you say would be the most important person framing like conservative intellectual thought? I, if I had to put gun to my head, I'd probably guess Tucker, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I mean, when, when you're talking in terms of, in terms of pound for pound, right. In terms of pound yeah. for pound, you would, you would definitely say Tucker, but I would, I would basically say that, I mean, I, I struggle to find something that Tucker and I would Sure. really defer on and so you know a lot of these times people will say like oh you know Pasobic was tweeting about something during the day and then tucker brought it up well it's like that doesn't mean like we're going into each other it just means that you know he's just on at a certain time and i'm you know when you're on twitter you're just you're just there all day but i think there's certainly an alignment there and so people see that there's definitely there's definitely streams that people swim in that go in the same direction and i would put it that way Okay, I think that's very reasonable. So in the pictures that they have, it's you, Steve Bannon, Laura Loomer, and Candace Owens. Let's go through those those three. What what do you think of all those in order? What do you think of Steve Bannon? Oh, I think I mean I think Steve, in terms of all of this, right? He's been one of the OGs from the Tea Party yeah. days, from the Breitbart days. And if you go back to Steve, him more than anyone out there. He really got the economic angle to this before anybody on on the right, honestly, because if you actually go back, you can even find in some of those old Tea Party you know, documentaries that he would make that he's actually kind of disagreeing with Andrew Breitbart when Andrew was around during the Tea Party, because Steve would be targeting the elites and and throughout that period saying, look, these guys got bailouts. These guys are scumbags. They're screwing over the little guy. Whereas I don't think the rest of the mainstream right at that period had quite gotten there yet. They hadn't quite gotten around to this idea of corporate crony capitalism. It was still very much, you know, hey, we support the free market, et cetera, et cetera. 
What about uh, let's throw the next person on this list? What about Candace Owens? I, I mean, to call her far right, I think is really kind of odd in that maybe she's unorthodox in certain ways, but she seems to. I don't think there's a single like boomer conservative who I would say is like the opposite, maybe a far right who would find Candace Owens to be someone unpa somewhat unpalatable. Yeah, no, I don't think so. But if if I'll put it this way though, that that Candace, in the same way as Tucker is also willing to discuss issues that I think are outside the sort of normal mainstream okay. Sean Hannity uh, lens. And I think one of those where she is quite heterodox on is, is Ukraine and foreign policy in general. Um, she'll talk about the invasion of Libya. She'll talk about Gaddafi wanting to put Africa back on the gold standard, right? She'll talk about all of it. She'll talk about uh, pharmaceuticals and, and vaccines and all these things. And in an area where, no, no, certainly there are, overlaps there but candace is really and a lot of this is just story selection honestly a lot yep. of it is just story selection the fact that you're if you're willing to talk about crime if you're willing to talk about the way the economy works today if you're willing to talk about what's actually going on on the ground you know then suddenly you're oh you're you know you're far right you're way outside of the mainstream but it's it's actually kind of interesting because if you look at joe wall's comment there where he says you know you people call jack posobic fringe and, and I would apply this to all of us. Not just, he's saying it about me, but it really applies to all of us. But they speak to more people than any of us do. <laughs> and so Let's get, like, Let me get the exact quote. So Joe Walsh, yeah. I've been on his show. He yeah. is, I think most people- I've, I've I done events with Joe. I, I called him a snake um, on Twitter. I went on his show. Uh, we had an interesting discussion. Uh, and he, his, his, I don't want to say shtick, but his uh, position is he used to be a Republican, Tea Party Republican, uh, very, you know, anti-Muslim immigration, like that vein of Republicanism. Now his entire feed is about denouncing Trumpism and what the Republican Party has become as a function of Trump. And he says, 10 years ago on MSNBC and CNN, you had great influence. Um, now, not a lot of people watch anymore. More people will listen to me if I go on someone's podcast. It's a completely different world. It has nothing to do with ideas. It has nothing to do with intellect. It's all about trolling people, getting clicks and being outrageous. The Jack Posobics are not fringe. They speak for a big chunk of the base. I think, do you think that that's accurate, that it's not about um, uh, ideas and not, nothing to do with ideas and nothing to do with intellect? Well, I think that's ridiculous, obviously, because that part of it is just silly. I mean, if if I came out with a with, you know, a terrible idea or if or a stupid move or if I I dropped one of these. We've been doing deep fakes a lot lately. I call that we do pre-creation, pre-created deep fakes. So where it's it's like I go, I go like one week into the future and then record what's going on and then come back in time and show you what's going to happen. And, uh, and and you know, it's we use humor. But if if we were just out there screaming about, uh, oh, you know, the lizards and the reptilians are coming for your children every day, nobody would listen, right? Nobody would right. listen except for obviously the lizards and reptilians because they know I've got the receipts on them. And it's 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 actually the second part of what he says is true. You know, funny enough, I actually met Candace Owens at a Joe Walsh event. That's not oh. what I remember. It was it was November of 2017. It was around Thanksgiving time up like suburban Chicago. I had Tanya and I had just gotten married. We hadn't even gone on our honeymoon yet because we'd like we, we, we'd booked it for like a month later. And uh, yeah, that's actually where I met Candace Owens. And so it's like, Joe, you know, you were the one who in, who put us all together <laughs> and now you're coming out and you're all upset about this. No, it's absolutely about ideas. And it's about the, the fact that the ideas that we're talking about are gaining traction with an audience, whereas the ideas of sort of that Paul Ryan, Mitt Romney, corporate conservative, neoconservative line are just they're falling flat and nobody wants to pay attention to that anymore. It's, it's simply it's as simple as that. It's you've lost in the marketplace of ideas. And if somebody came up tomorrow, by the way, who had you know better ideas than us, then guess what? We, you know, we would all lose, too. But that's not happening. Yeah, I think Sean, Joe Walsh's brand of or boomer conservatism is by definition a devoid of ideas. Their only action is to flip their shit over whatever the left is doing at a given point in time. And wow, can you believe what the left is doing this week? And they shake their fist and they put their memes. Hey, hey, could you could you imagine if if the situation were reversed? Huh? <laughs> right. huh? And it's, it's just like, oh my God, it's so unfair. Look what they're doing. This is terrible. Right, exactly. We need to go back to the Constitution. Lather, rinse, repeat for decades. 
and not have any pretense of a competing worldview or competing set of issues. And, it's, and by the way, like let's look at let's look at the stats on boomer conservatism because, and that's by the way, that's not an attack. I mean, Steve obviously is a baby boomer as well, so it doesn't mean okay. that he's you know. I, I, every time I say that, people are like, "Oh, why are you calling out the babies?" I'm not. I'm talking about a specific. It's an idea set. You could be you know. There's a whole idea of a 30 year old boomer, right? You know, yes, this correct. You know, drinking the white monster, and there's it's 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 an idea set that's what we're, ta we're talking about but you go look at the what have you conserved so the wall street journal had this poll out today which is just mind-blowing to me uh patriotism is down they said what what are things what are values that are very important to you in 1998 the word patriotism said was 70 percent of people this is pre 9 11 even pre 9 11 when bill clinton's president nine or 70 percent of people in 1998 said that patriotism was was very important to them today it's 38 percent uh with religion it was sick it went from 62 percent to 39 percent having wow. children 59 percent to 30 percent community involvement wait, wait, hold on is, i interrupt you it said yeah 30 percent of people said children are important 30 i don't i can't even wrap my head around that okay 30 uh, and that's very important. So it went very important, went from 59 to now some, now I, I don't have all their cross tabs. It may be some people said somewhat important, you know, okay. but, but still very important was at 59%. And so this is, you know, it's a huge softening and then community involvement down from 47% to 27%. And the only thing that has increased over the same time frame, money, <laughs> just the word money has gone from 31% to 43%. But it, it, yeah, it, and it's it's kind of uh, uh, fascinating because I don't see what the Joe Walsh's path to victory means or what it actually looks like, as opposed to this kind of perpetual WWE scenario where you know the Democrats get with their way seventy five percent, and then twenty five percent the conservatives you know kind of eke out a win and have them pull back a little bit on their goals, but the needle always moves inexorably in one very specific direction. Well, that's exactly right. And and so the, you'll have conservatives saying, uh, oh, we stopped them. We stopped the left we want. We stopped the left we want. No, you didn't. No, you all you did was you stopped them now. They're the ones who are still pushing the Overton window. They're still pushing the country. They're still pushing the culture. They're pushing all of their issues forward. I mean, we're arguing over we, we were joking in the in in, in pre uh, the pre-show. I was like, I was like, hello, doctor. I'm here for my genital reassignment. Um, one of Florida Lee, like Saint, like uh, like King Lewis. And it's like that's the the territory that we've pushed so far on on some of the just on the culture side um you know should we go to nuclear war with russia and i don't know maybe you know you know and it's it's these insane levels of conversations where and i look at the numbers and i'm like it, it conservative or the republicans at least had power for so much of that time and then you look at where the country is it's like you could win elections but you lost the country because everything was shifting under your feet while you just sat there and kept rapping over and over of well we just got to get back to the constitution we just just got to get back to it man we just got to we just got to read that paper a little bit more and and read it and it's like the country is moving on okay right and so and and that doesn't mean that you abandon the va the immutable values of the constitution certainly they have to come forward but you can't just sit there and if that's your marketing pitch over and over, chris christie chris christie just said that he's on his way to new hampshire he said he's looking for a path he's looking at he, he should find a walking path first by the way but chris christie's looking for a path to victory i said chris if you tried this right you tried this uh in 2016 you're not gonna have it because it was the same situation where he at least went to those and look i was in central pennsylvania over um a couple of times over the past couple of weeks and uh, originally from pennsylvania um and and i gotta tell you there's there's still trump flags everywhere everywhere right yeah. in those areas in those working class areas it's like american flag american flag american flag trump flag don't vote don't blame me i voted for trump um trump 2020 trump 24 trump for, like it's it's crazy right you would never see this for any other politician and I don't I don't mean to make this political, but I'm saying that there's there's a lot going on in the country. And if anyone's ever seen the movie Falling Down, um, they act, it actually kind of talks about some of these issues, at least in the subset of L.A., but now it's everywhere. You know, I, I just want to correct you a little bit. Don't count Chris Christie out, because if it was 1911, no one other than literally would have seen a President William Howard Taft coming, uh, excuse me, 1907. And one year later, he was in the White House getting stuck in the bathtub. So you never know. <laughs> you never know. Historic, 
there's historical precedent. Um, what, There's that great line from talking? SNL where they were like, where they were, where they were doing the um, the pre recordings of of Jimmy Carter's or no Gerald Ford's death. There's like, oh, Gerald Ford has died. He's been he's he was torn apart by wolves this morning, and he's like, that's just crazy. That would never happen. And the, and the producer comes over the side and he's like, no, Taft Taft was eaten by wolves. Really? <laughs> Folks, did you know that your temperature at night can have one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you wake up too hot or too cold, I highly recommend you check out Miracle Maid's bed sheets. It's got self-cooling properties for better quality sleep using silver-infused fabrics. Originally developed by NASA, Miracle Maid sheets are thermoregulating and designed to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long. Get better sleep every night. Self-cleaning, they're infused with natural silver, which prevents 99.9% .9 of bacterial growth, leaving them cleaner, fresher, three times longer than other sheets. And Miracle Sheets are comfortable without the high price tag of other brands. Stop sleeping on bacteria. Clean sheets means less bacteria to clog your pores, fewer breakouts, and other skin problems. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice to try it today. We've got a special deal for you. Save over 40% and use our promo code malice at checkout to save even more. And you get three free towels. Miracle is so confident in their product it's backed with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash malice. Use the code malice to get your three-piece towel set for free. Save over 40% off. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash malice to treat yourself. Thank you, Miracle Made, for sponsoring this episode. Let's get back to the show. What do you think? So la the last one on this list is okay. someone who's been a guest of, uh, on this show a couple times, uh, who I always have a sweet spot in my heart for. And your old uh, partner in crime, literally crime, uh, Laura Loomer. Uh, she's been very hard against uh, the DeSantis crimes people. against crimes against theater. Crimes against yes. theater, to be clear. I, I'm, I'm, I'm an anarchist. That's a crime I can endorse. But she's been very, very hard against the DeSantis people on, on uh, Twitter of late. Uh, very feisty as is Laura's you know, personality. What are your thoughts about her and, and her work recently? Look, say what you want about Laura, but she's a survivor. Yeah. Um, she's always found a way to continue going forward. She just got back on Twitter during – a lot of people just got back on Twitter after – uh, Elon came in and I say the more the merrier, but you know, if, if you are too scared to go up against Laura Loomer, then how are you ever going to face, uh, the, the, Vladimir Putin or, or Xi Jinping or, or, um, deal with the people at the UN or the world economic forum or any of these things where she's just a person with a Twitter account and a following and she's speaking to people. And if it's getting resonance, like maybe you should actually consider why rather than just, Oh, you know, Shut up, Lara. There's a technique that the corporate press uses, which is like amazingly transparent, but they use it all the time because I guess it works for blue pilled people. And it's this it's the Jenga of bad things. They rattle off a list of dubious but extremely negative claims. And then yes. they'll say, well, we're quoting uh, the uh, anti poverty, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, and so they, they have a list of, oh, you promote Russian. Have you ever promoted Russian military intelligence operations? I, I actually am a Russian intelligence operation. As a matter of fact, my entire life from birth began, um, on the space station Mir. Uh, at the time, I was I love, created sorry, by so. I love the idea people. that someone who's so Polish and like proud to be a, a Pole is supposed to be this hardcore. No, no, that's all, that's all the cover. That's all the cover. That's yeah. all the cover. Of course. Well, I don't know. There was it was they knew they had to they were like, we, we have the Slavic DNA, but we've got to shift it one over to just confuse everybody. So we'll make him Polish, not Russian. And uh, yeah, we'll give the them all this Irish, we'll British, this... same shit, right? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's no milk in the tea. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. No. And it's 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 like it's it's. it's it's actually hilarious too. Well, actually, one of my favorite ones of this was, and it's it's recent, and that's why it was so good. So, did you notice when they mentioned they said one of Posobiec's recent attacks? They said he's a he's he's made crude attacks on Antifa, right? Oh, the communists. Oh God, God forbid. Um, then an attack on the 1619 project, which honestly I don't even remember that one, but probably. And and then it says and transgender rights with quote genital Gestapo, right? So it says quote genital Gestapo which was the title of one of my pre one of my episodes, I think like a week ago. Right. But here's what's so interesting is in that episode, the phrase genital Gestapo is not said by me or one of my guests. It's said by a transgender activist 
slamming uh, Ron DeSantis and his bill down in Florida. It's one of these um, one of these one of these new bills that's rolling out. This is the one where they're up there at this like public forum and then they stab themselves with a syringe. I think you've probably seen it. It's, it's going yeah. viral everywhere. But my point is, is that I didn't say that. OK, one of their activists said that. And then they do the Jenga of bad things where it says, well, it's it's his online activity included this. Right. So it doesn't say that I said it, but it puts it in quotes and it certainly makes it sound yes. like it's something that I said. And then the next person that reads this corporate press or the way Wikipedia works is that some neckbeard over there, which is who controls uh, Wikipedia, will then go take that. And so, oh, well, Posobiec has referred to transgender rights as the genital Gestapo. And here's an article from The Guardian, which proves it. Right. Yes. Which, by the There's way, was source. amazing that and kind of, here's an approved source and they're whitelisted. Um, one of the one of my favorite quotes or, or I guess recent revelations about Wikipedia is that did you know that on the Jeffrey Epstein entry on Wikipedia, as of right now, the word pedophile does not appear once. Are you serious? No. The only place that it's in, if you go and search it, it's all the way down. And in some of the cited articles had it in the URL, but it's not actually in the article itself. The word pedophile is not there. Wow. Um, but it's, but uh, let me just finish finance was, year former, you know, yeah, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, man of the year, art collector, um, <laughs> influencer. Uh, it's just interesting. Island affection, Caribbean affectionado. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vac vacationer, um, yes. hobnobber and, and jet setter. W w my, my point earlier, which I never finished is what they'll do is so they'll quote, um, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and they, and they refer to it explicitly as a nonprofit legal advocacy organization, Amazing. which is like calling it the NRA, which calls itself like a human rights organization, uh, which is fine, but it's like it's not in completely honest. So what they do is they'll have this uh, uh, hardcore leftist uh, um, advocacy group. They'll quote it as if it's an objective source and it's a snake eating its own tail because then they could say, hey, we're not saying it. We're just quoting this one objective source, which we mm -hmm. all happen to use. And then the Southern Private Law Center could be like, hey, we're not journalists. We're just presenting the, our research as we see it. And it, it's they do this over and over and over. That's the one organization they use. But it's interesting to me how there's so little, um, I don't know if momentum is the word, on the right of taking down the SPLC. Well, I think there has been some, um, okay. and I've seen it in drips and drabs because they just had one of their lawyers arrested down at this Treehouse Antifa incident a couple of weeks ago outside of Atlanta, where this this you know there was a, a you know building a training facility for cops out there, and one of their actual staff lawyers was arrested and charged with domestic terrorism. Oh wow. Um, in terms of this, so an actual, and this isn't like someone associated with a no, full on, you know, full time staffer. And of course, they say, well, it's just a legal observer. So it's a legal. Well, that's a made up position, right? <laughs> you can be a lawyer and still commit crimes, as we, we found out with the two in New York City. So just because you're a lawyer, that doesn't give you some special, you know, privilege. It's like when, um, like when Chris Cuomo used to say that uh, he went on CNN and he said, well, you know, you can't look at the WikiLeaks documents uh, from Hillary Clinton and John Podesta because those were hacked. And so that's uh, using stolen material. So that's a crime. And then he kind of catches himself because he realizes that he's discussing them in the same segment and he catches himself. This is Mr. Yale Law, Chris Cuomo. And he goes. He goes, we can because as journalists, we have privileges. It's like, what do you mean? You don't right. have any special privilege. It's just it's the same First Amendment that anyone would have uh, in this country, whether it doesn't matter how you obtain the material whatsoever. And which, you know, even then it's you know, not even necessarily proven how all that came out. But my point is that they'll play these games in to your, to your point there. Um, they'll play these games of we have some magical privilege. This group has a magical pr privilege. They're true. Actually. A buddy and I, years ago, a decade ago at this point, back when we were still in the Intel community, we used to always quite, we used to always ask this because we would sometimes, and obviously I can't talk about classified, but I can just speak about it generally. You know, we would send up a report and I'd say, hey, I've got the source and he says this and we had a thing and he came or walk in, whatever it is, right? And this is what was said. And then we, every once in a while, if, if it didn't comport with whatever the corporate line was, we would get some you know, uh, inevitably, we would get some response from higher leadership that would say, ah, that's not credible. <laughs> what do you mean? It's not credible. Depending on who, 
determined by who. And so we would joke that there that there is actually a, a the secret, secret deep state. The deep, deep state is actually the office of credibility. And so the office of credibility has determined this to be credible or non-credible. And so it's it's almost like the office of credibility actually now exists in corporate media. So we've determined these people yeah. to be credible or not. Uh, you saw this very infamously with this guy, Malcolm Nance, who just got yep. completely he. So he lost his credibility card over the weekend. And not to get into that whole thing, but I think it's interesting to to point out how this works. So this is a guy. He goes on MSNBC. He goes on CNN. He goes on Bill Maher, CNN, and MSNBC or CNN and, and Bill Maher, HBO. That's the same company. That's Warner Brothers. That's Time Warner or whatever. Warner Discovery. They're calling themselves now. So. He goes on and he's, I, I know the truth about Russia. I know the truth about Ukraine. I know the truth about Trump supporters. That's all sorts of crazy stuff. And you wonder, how is it that this guy's allowed? He just, I mean, wild stuff. You got to, your neighbors are insurgents and you have to prepare to fight them. Actually said this. Um, and, and that's, oh yeah, yeah, Malcolm. Yeah, that's, that's really important. Oh, that's very good. And he's like, he's going, going all these podcasts and everything. There's a, that famous uh, video of him in Lviv, where he's, you know, you know, stand by the missiles are coming, you know, it's a, and everyone's just walking around in the back where like, yeah, dude, we know like it's, we're used to this by now. Um, he just got his credibility card pulled by the New York times that put up this massive stolen valor. These guys have been lying the whole time. They've been grifting off Ukraine and this guy has just been like making accusations that have been baseless. And yet I'm sitting there going, well, wait a minute. I was saying that all along. I've been saying that for years about this guy. But for some reason, the office of credibility has given him this halo to allow him to sit there and say whatever he wants, pontificate right. about every once. He's given this sort of pass to, to say or do whatever he wants. And what's interesting because, if, you know, on the Ukraine issue, on, on, for, if you're looking for volunteers, there's lot, there's lots of people that are far more credible than him that you could easily just, just bring on. Maybe they won't say what you want them to say, but you know, they're not, they won't bring along all the baggage this guy does, but suddenly there's this shift internally where it's, Oh no, wait, no, he's not credible anymore. So it's like, okay, are you going to go back and pull all of the things that he said over the years? Are you going to, uh, go reach every person in that audience? Are you going to apologize for having this guy on for spreading lies for years? Are you going to continue to have, how does this work? Right. And, and it might be that they just kind of phase him out. Okay. And then they'll move on to the next one. And this is again, another classic tactic of corporate media that, you know, they'll, they'll take somebody and it's like, look, when you make a deal with the mafia, it's like, Hey, that's a great deal. And you have a great deal until the day you don't. Because one day the mafia is going to turn on you and say, you know what, you're too hot, you're too much trouble, you don't have a deal with us anymore. We're going to go make a deal with the next guy, and you're going to get cut loose. And now they're just now they're just sweeping it under the rug. They're cleaning up loose ends. Yeah, one of the things that people have talked about, which I think is indisputably true, is that you know as as the internet has developed, there's a, the distinction between news and entertainment has somewhat shifted. Right now, the sure. claim is that on one end of the spectrum you would have the New York Times, which is objective, clear journalism. At the other end would be like pot, like Rogan, where it's just two guys shooting the shit, and they both could be talking out of their ass, and there's no one really there to be a judge to be like, wait a minute, uh, you guys are both wrong, or so on and so forth. And then you have places like C CNN or Fox, or just somewhere in between, where they're presenting the news but it's clearly from an angle or the host has an opinion of their own the guests have opinions of their own and so on and, and, and so forth but the point is what if if you are trying to be the new york times and you're presenting things that are this i always make the point that there's a difference between having a bias and having an agenda if everyone has a bias to some extent you're going to have your when you're going to read the news you're going to have your own angle you're going to have your own perspective on it an agenda is when the truth is secondary when you have the story written first then you find the facts that would suit your story and you ignore the facts that don't and the reason i bring this up is all those intelligence officials i think it was 50 who claimed that hunter biden's laptop had all the classic signs of russian disinformation they didn't say what those signs were it's not like the r's were backward on the laptop and when that became public and they kind of had that walk that back, the question to what you just brought up is, are those 50 intelligence officials who either brazenly lied or were completely incompetent in their opinion about the veracity of the laptop, are they going to be persona non grata or are they going to have them right back on as if nothing happened? Are they going to keep uh, returning their phone calls? Now, if you are interested in facts and truth and integrity, you're going to be like, all right. Once bitten, twice shy. These guys really screwed me on a major issue and possibly tipped an election. I can't count them as reliable. But 
this is kind of the wait and see. I have no doubt that they're just going to completely pretend like nothing happened and still use, use those 50 people as uh, sources. And they'll have no consequences for it, at best being completely incompetent and wrong. No, I mean, if anything, they'll they'll be given contributorships. I mean, you got that guy, Adam Kinzinger, who was all over that. He yep. put him on the January 6th committee. By the way, Adam Kinzinger, this the same uh, story in The New York Times today or that or I guess over the weekend came out. It was and we're going to talk be talking about it on Human Events Daily. He isn't mentioned anywhere in the article because they're still kind of using him. But he was on the board. He was on the board of this company that was just raising money completely. And they would stand in front of like a Russian tank that was blown up and they would say, hey, look what we did. And you're like, why is your, you know, you know, anyone who served is like, why is your uniform speckless? Why are you, you know, you're, you're, you're going out there claiming you had the game winning touchdown and there isn't a speck of, of dirt or, or anything on your uniform. What's going on? Why are, there, why are there no magazines in your, you know, your pouches, et cetera. And so he's on the board of this. Now he's not mentioned, but he's another one of these guys who, they sort of they needed him to serve a purpose for the Gen 6 Commission. They needed him for some of the Ukraine stuff. They've given him a contributorship at CNN. But you get a sense that his his credibility, his star, his influence is kind of waning as as these one, one of these like anti, you know, anti MAGA, anti conservative conservatives. And so eventually at some point it'll just dwindle down to where all he has is his CNN spot. And then, you know, what will happen. They'll phase him out and they'll find another one. Hey, this is Adam Carolla. Let me tell you about my podcast. We do it uh, every single day, so you can subscribe, and there'll always be a fresh one waiting for you. It's about two hours of uh, topics, topical topics, and news, and guests, and uh, comedians, and, of course, my own vitriolic take on uh, just about everything that's going on in the world. Plus... Um, we get a lot of really interesting, uh, notable people who come in. We'll get politicians, we'll get uh, tastemakers, we'll get stand-ups, we'll get uh, authors, we'll get uh, pundits, we'll get, uh, what I say? Well, I think about covers it all, celebrities as well. And uh, we'll do some really interesting interviews with them. You can get The Adam Carolla Show wherever you download your podcast. So let's get to the crux of this article, which is comparing you to someone who I think is might be emblematic of the most pathetic aspects of conservatism, and that is George Will. Um, George Will is kind of the marginally intelligence person uh, person's vision of a smart conservative because he's very cerebral. I would guess I would put a significant amount of money that he's on the spectrum. I've never seen him or heard him say anything particularly insightful or bright or move the needle. The smartest thing I ever heard him say, because it was very cleverly worded, is when he had said, um, Bill Clinton is not the worst president, but he's the worst person to become president. I'm like, okay, that's a clever turn of phrase. But this article is bemoaning that George Will, who is incapable of rousing people to action, getting them excited, he speaks like a robot, and not in like a fun Lex way, but in a complete like, you know, is this guy on a, on a life support kind of Terry Shiva way. Um, and he has his views, but they're completely kind of this um, heritage foundation. We need marginal tax cuts and, and you know, slight changes in the um, uh, what's going on in Washington and everything's going to be saved. And the Democrats are just kind of wrong on the issues. But once we sit down and talk to them, everything's going to work out. Uh, what's your perspective on having been compared to uh, um, George Will, who left the Republican Party, by the way, as a result of Trump? Well, so. I think that and, and a lot of people have been asking me about this, and I, I think they're saying, well, well, they're trying to compare me to George Will. But I don't actually think and, and Dave Weigel, the guy who actually wrote that from some for I mean, he's no fan of mine. But what I think he was actually trying to get at was to talk about the positional influence that George Will, when he was at National Review specifically, had over okay. the Republican Party and the Republican electorate, over donors, over the the direction of things, if you will, this idea that, you know, if this guy was was going to because people would turn to him for kind of, you know, there he was a thought leader. Right. So how do I you know, how should I feel about the cigarette ban was was a thing that he was, you know, he was hugely against in the 1990s. What about individual responsibility? Uh, climate change was another big one where, again, he's he's not necessarily disagreeing with the left, but he's also saying like, well, sure, this is happening, but is it happening this much? Or, right. you know, how should we respond to it? Or, you know, maybe maybe humans aren't the the exact 
cause of it and you know kind of putting up these sort of like little responses instead of telling you know instead of like like me i i just call out greta thunberg for deleting a tweet saying that you know that the um the world was going to end in five years when it didn't end i get fact checked by it by newsweek they said she didn't say the world was going to end in five years she said humanity was going to end and so therefore you were false right you're, and it's you're like, fake news Jack, so <laughs> i'm fake no i'm fake news again i'm fake news again that's right she said humanity and and not the world was going to end my goodness my goodness no and it's it's this idea of i think a lot of it is tactical too right so much of this and not to get into that but it's 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 more I, i'm not I'm not going to meet them because their ideas are stupid. So I'm not going to debate them on their right. stupid ideas. It's it's I'm just going to defeat them. And it's as simple as that. Uh, I'm not really interested in having a conversation with someone saying that they can turn my four year old who's sitting in the next room um, doing Khan Academy, um, <laughs> that they can turn him into a little girl. Like, no, I'm, I'm not interested in having a conversation with that person. I just want to de defeat them and take away all of their influence over society. It's, it's pretty as simple as that. And so to compare me to George Will, I don't think is necessarily what they're trying to do. What I think they're trying to do is explain that this sort of George Will uh, pyramid of influence is now gone. And that that has been totally shunted or it's, you know, that's obsolete, that's the dinosaurs, that's buried underground. And there's this new influence ecosystem that it's it's actually, if anything, it's a wake up call, I think, to the readers of The Guardian, to other, you know, yep. sort of media, you know, signaling other people out in the media saying, hey, you are paying attention to the wrong people because that's not who the voters are paying attention to. That's not who the other conservatives are paying attention to. And so if they're not keying off of those guys, then these these thoughts, these ideas, these memes, right, to, to use the actual phrase um, of a meme as the as the uh, as the imprimatur of a of a cultural artifact, right, that, that that is sent through the universe, that, you know, the memes are running in a different direction. They're not running from George Will anymore, and they're getting out to the people. And that's why you can you can get these folks who, like I said, up in central Pennsylvania, have a complete have a completely different mindset than anybody who reads National Review. And they're like, well, where are you getting this from? And it's right. like, well, we're, we're getting it from the podcast we listen to. We're getting it from the shows. And and by the way, and it's it's the same. <clears throat> Rush Limbaugh used to joke about this when he would call people his his audience ditto heads, because one of the knocks that that um, they would put on the Rush Limbaugh audience was that, well, they're just agreeing with Rush. They just they're robotic. They're doing whatever he said. I said, I don't think so. No, I think I think he's resonating with people because they feel a sense of loss, because they feel a sense of loss in culture. They feel a sense of loss in patriotism and family and community. And oh, look, the Wall Street Journal has come out and completely, uh, ex you know, explained this religion, having children, money is the only thing that's raising. And it's because the the thought leaders or the actual leaders, the elite, whatever word you want to call them, the reptilians, the lizards, etc., they they've they've replaced all of that with multiculturalism. And they've been doing so through a process since the 1990s. And and if you look at, you know, there's, there's lots of movies about this and there's people that have that have gone into it and into some of these issues. I think in California is one of the first places it happened. And that's why you see a lot of like L.A. based movies uh, in the 90s that talked about this. But now it's hitting the whole country. And it's this idea. That's why even if you go out like you go talk to Scott Presser when he goes and he does his door knocking, his ballot harvesting stuff. Well, they'll they'll do data at the big political level that says, if you're going into a neighborhood and if you see somebody with an American flag outside of their house, well, then there's like, they're nine times more likely to be a, Republic, a conservative Republican than someone who doesn't. And it didn't used to be like that. You know, it certainly didn't used to be like that in America. And yet it has become that way. So to call someone who views these things or, or lives like, you know, I've, I've talked about on on other podcasts before about how you know we had to leave my town where that where i grew up where my father grew up where his parents grew up where my family had always lived since we had arrived from poland because of crime that we had we had always been uh, my kids are the first kid the first posobics in america to have not been baptized at the same church right so we i mean we had had a community the kids that i played with were the kids that were the the children of the people that my father had grown up with yeah right? it was just one of those normal you know, you, you hear stories like this across the Northeast um, and it's not like in the, in the Rust Belt. It's not like I'm you know, anything special, but it's it's having lived through that and then being able to articulate it and actually question whether these things are good, um, that suddenly you get this label of far right. Yeah. And, and I mean, my story is the same thing. I mean, it's been only 
uh, over 40 years, but my whole family has been in Brooklyn since the day we stepped foot off that plane from uh, you know, Italy, the Soviet Union via Italy. And now uh, everyone is out of there other than my grandma, who's in uh, Brighton Beach, which is a Russian Jewish community, because what has happened to New York City, uh, I, I, you, I would never have thought it could have happened. And now I'm in Austin. The rest of the family is in Florida. And this was not, and I'm sure it wasn't for your family as well. This wasn't like a flip of the coin a light decision. This was something that was a last resort and, and something that was very devastating in many ways. Right. And so it's actually something that I, that I think about with my kids a lot. And it's, you know, we're pretty involved with, we've, we've actually found a pretty good church that we like uh, that's nearby and has one of those communities. And that's what I'm looking for, yeah. right? I'm looking for a community where, Hey, the kids know each other. The parents know each other. We hang out on Friday nights for fish fry because it's Lent. We, you know, we see each other on Sunday morning. Someone has a kid, you know, hey, you know, you, you congratulate them. You know them if you're uh, those the millennial elder millennial Zoomer generations right now. They're all nomads. They're all nomads. They they're all they're always moving for work. They're always picking up and going to different places. They're they're, um, you know, traveling the country. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But what I'm saying is that's not how we all used to live. And yeah. it actually was better when we lived in towns that had these tight knit communities rather than, you know, it didn't used to be that you needed a ring doorbell, you know, your ring camera on your front and back of your house because your neighbor would tell you what was going on when you weren't home or the guy at the end of the street or the old lady who was always walking around that kind of knew everybody in the neighborhood. That was a normal thing. And that wasn't, that was the Norman America for generations. And the idea that all of that can change and all of that can go away by decision. And that's what people need to understand is because whenever you talk about specifically this issue, they will say, the left will say it's happening and it's good. But if someone on the right brings up and criticizes it, they'll say that's not happening. That's a conspiracy theory. Right. And this is, um, Michael Anton has a phrase about that. He calls it the, the celebration parallax, where he'll say, that it's it's a parallax because if you bring it up and criticize these these changes to our society and again like the wall street journal has they'll they'll say well that's not happening that's conspiracy theory but when the left says it when when joy reed goes up and says oh this is great this is wonderful we celebrate this we love this then of course it's happening it's wonderful and these are just these are just um natural organic trends that are happening and happen to any country it's like really do they happen to Japan? Do they happen to right, China? Right. Do they happen to Korea? I haven't, I haven't seen any of these things go on. I lived in China for two years. I didn't see any of this. Japan's been there for how long? <laughs> you know, they've never experienced this. Longer than us. <laughs> yeah, pr pretty long last time I checked. And so, no, th these were decisions. These were decisions made by leaders over a period of time to, th there's a reason the steel belt turned into the rust belt. There's a reason, I mean, you look what's been done to the, the, the amount of programs that have been run over the South since, it, it, since the South has been there, basically. Uh, and certainly since they lost the war. The idea that these weren't decisions that were that were done by 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 decision makers is actually kind of laughable and silly. Um, you have a lot of influence and contact within uh, Trump world and MAGA. I'm very curious to hear your thoughts. By the way, by the way, I and I'm totally cutting you off. I know, but I'm I, like I said, I'm from the Philly area. We do that. Um, Hundred percent. He didn't eat that bun at dinner last week. Well, what what, I, what are you referring to? So he and I at dinner last week. And, oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so when we got to dinner, and, and it was Tanya, it was myself, it was surf and turf that night. So there was like strip steak. Oh, I forgot that you post that picture. That's right. I'm and, sorry. Yeah, 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 go yeah. Ahead. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we had the strip steak. We had, you know, we had jumbo shrimp. It was awesome. He gets a cheeseburger. He gets it brought <laughs> out with the ketchup, of course. Um, cheeseburger, cheeseburger is brought to him as, as well as a couple of the uh, a couple of the jumbo shrimp, but they bring the bun for the cheeseburger. And I remember, and we're, you know, we're talking, we're talking election, talking strategy, you know, what do you think of this guy? What do you think of that guy? And, and I noticed the entire night though, I said, is he going to put that bun on that, on that cheeseburger and eat it? He doesn't. He picks up a fork and knife and starts eating the cheeseburger, leaves the bun aside. So the, the staffer had brought him the bun, but he left it there. And I said, you know what? This is Trump keto. He's yeah. going Trump keto. And then people are all out there, you know, saying they're looking at these pictures of the rally from I guess what Saturday and people are saying, is this, is this photoshopped? Is this edited? You know, this isn't what he looks like normally. I said, no, he's, he's, he's getting in the, he's getting in a fighting shape. You know, he's getting, getting up for getting ready for the fight. He's so keto. Even his peas orange now. Exactly. 
It's all Wait, so, it's all oranges. But that being said, he did eat. I, and, I, and I'm and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. President. I'm sorry, Mr. President. But I will be accurate. Uh, the dessert that was delivered to the table was bananas Foster Ooh. with uh, with mini mini donuts, and he did eat the bananas Foster. However, he did not touch those mini donuts. That is an old school dessert. That's like having like ambrosia salad or uh, you know like an aspic for dinner. It's Mar-a-Lago, man. That's like that's the you know that was like the shining jewel of the Gilded Age, you know Palm Beach, Meriwether yeah. Post. Um, just whole that whole like you know american versailles kind of thing going on down there and it's you know it's it, he's definitely kept the kept some of those accoutrements going you know and i remember because it wasn't even me that noticed the bananas foster that was it was my it was tanya of course and i said are you sure that wasn't like a bananas jubilee she said no that was caramel that was bananas foster okay okay <laughs> what do you think of his chances versus desantis in let's talk about that first the in, it, there's desantis is probably almost certainly going to we both know he's going to run uh chris christie's feeling it out tim scott senator from i believe south carolina uh sununu chris sununu i think is chris's first name uh uh i think current senator or former governor of new hampshire i don't even remember nikki haley has announced mike pompeo uh, is look certain to run. Mike Pence looks certain to run. Uh, I want to hear your thoughts on handicapping the field. Well, yeah, you notice what what pe with people like Sununu getting in the race, there's sort of this this strategy that's called the favorite son strategy. Yeah. And so it's this idea of that. And you saw this. Um, I think the only guy that actually worked with in 2016 was Kasich in in Ohio, where they'll take someone. I, I mean, Cruz won Texas as well. So they'll take someone who's a well known politician from a a state who may not have broad-based national appeal, but is very well liked by the people of their state, their constituency. And so they'll run in the primary and they'll get some funding, even though they know that that person doesn't have the national appeal, but they'll be there to block and handicap someone that the establishment right. feel is threatened by because they know that, hey, our guy might only be able to get 30%, but if 30% is the plurality that you're able to eke out by having this maximum field, and a lot of these states are winner take all, then great, that's all you need, right? So you throw in these most favored sons and you have them. They tried this also with um, uh, Evan McMuffin when he was in uh, oh, yeah. uh, when he was in Utah, right? And then he tried to run. It was just the whole thing was a complete uh, disaster. I actually run into him in DC like all the time when he's always always hanging out with the Qataris. Interesting how that works. And um, the uh, the uh, I'm surprised he hasn't gone to Ukraine either. No, I, I think that I think that you're you're seeing a situation where 2024 is shaping up to look a lot like 2016. I think the analogs are completely in place. I think that if you look at the momentum, it's completely in place with the only the only real difference being that obviously when you look at the field, I mean, OK, Trump was president. Right. So he won, right. he did win a national election, which he's going to be able to say on any debate stage that's he's going to say, you guys say I, I can't win. I did win. None of you did. Um, I've won one of these things already. So you have to make the the, the argument that you're electable, not me. I, I was able to prove this. Um, and then obviously 2020 was a crazy year, COVID and everything that was the BLM riot, total, total color revolution in the United States. Um, but the idea that, you know, he can't win, I've always thought was kind of like a silly argument as far as, you know, as far as the, this DeSantis rollout, I, I I'll put it this way. I don't necessarily think you'd be hearing a lot of noise from Tim Scott and all these other guys, Chris Christie, if the DeSantis rollout had gone, had been stronger. Um, I don't think it was as strong as a lot of people were were hyping it up to be. I think it was something in 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 the pro in the pro wrestling world they would say uh, you know they would say like he's got he's got to learn a new hold, you know he's got to learn a new hold he's got to you know go back to you know go back to the regional circuit for a minute figure out a new hold and then come back because it just didn't quite get over. It's like it's like he's the intercontinental champion and he wants that he wants that shot at the strap right but you gotta you know you gotta get there. Jack I know you're like me you're very concerned about the future of this country this is why I asked you so much about what's going on in today and tomorrow in politics but I do want to take a second talk to Patriots about Patriot Gold. Folks if you've been on the fence about buying gold and silver have you seen what's going on around us the Silicon Valley Bank collapse the government bailing them out with our taxpayer money possibly uh, Xi Jinping's meeting with Putin in Russia and behind the scenes while we're not paying attention MasterCard, Citigroup, all those big global banking giants, they're starting a digital dollar pilot or Biden bucks, which Biden has fast tracked this development. What does that mean? It means that the Fed can monitor every transaction and devalue purchasing power even more. The corporate press wants you to watch Biden give away money to Ukraine. Even Republican presidential hopefuls 
are singing that same tune as they announced their bid for 2024. You know where else they have digital money? China. Yes, seriously. China's digital currency helps the CCP punish or coerce citizens with social credit systems. If a citizen commits a minor infraction, you can be blacklisted from traveling, going to restaurants, renting a home, or even having insurance. You don't think that could happen here? Look what happened during COVID. Digital is currently a major step in expanding digital authoritarianism. Meanwhile, according to Bloomberg, the world is in the midst of a macroeconomic reset, but the shining star is gold. The Wall Street Journal has stated that gold prices may be headed for record highs this year. So call the proud Americans of the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late and mention my name. That's Michael Malice. You'll always get best in class service from Patriots protecting Patriots. Patriot Gold Group has the no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold or silver. You may be eligible for the no fee for life IRA and qualifying rollovers. All you got to do is call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide, or just go to malicegold.com. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top-rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row, so call 888-505-9845, or just go to malicegold.com. Let's go back to Jack. There's a certain irony, and I, I'm very curious to hear your thoughts, that Mike Pence, who is pretty much a textbook social conservative in his personal life, I mean, the guy you know could be the villain in Footloose if there was a remake, it seems to me that he is I, I just despised among conservatives in the Republican Party, uh, even though he clearly, of, of all four candidates, did the best job in the 2020 debates where he just absolutely annihilated uh, Kamala Harris. And this is a, you know running against the first African-American uh, um, vice presidential candidate and a female. So he kind of was handicapped a little and he just decimated her and it was just a, a beautiful, beautiful moment. Um, are, what are your thoughts on Pence and his relationship with the Republican base? You know, I, I think Pence would have been like the perfect Republican candidate in the 1950s, the 1960s. You know, he speaks to a part of the party and he's he's from the Midwest. Right. So his you know, people will say, like, why did Trump pick him? And I would say it's and this is something that, you know, you being a New Yorker, you get this, that that people in New York speak a certain kind of way. Yeah. People on the East Coast speak a certain kind of way that people in the Midwest, people in Oregon, people in I don't, they just don't talk that way. Yeah. And it doesn't roll off that, you know, yep. people saying like, uh, yeah, uh, Trump had that picture of the baseball bat with Alvin Bragg. You're like, I would have smacked him upside the head with a baseball bat. Right. That's, that's like any New York subway. You're going to hear 10 times worse than that. Oh, yeah. You know, growing up in the Philly area, that's right from, and not just, not just from guys, by the way, you should hear how some of those single women talk, but there's, there's a part of the country where that doesn't play out where that doesn't play over. And I think that is the Midwest. And you're seeing, you're starting to see it increasingly in the suburbs that, and just, you know, regardless of where you are, these more, more affluent um, upper middle-class suburbs that they don't have that same kind of, or they don't like that kind of pugnacious, aggressive, bellicose um, take on things, you know, unless of course you are Michael Douglas and falling down, in which case yeah, right. you're all for it. Um, so, it, it made sense for Trump to have a guy like that next to him to say, hey, it's OK. Hey, it's OK. We get it. Right. We've got this guy, good cop, bad cop, Mutt and Jeff. Mm -hmm. So for Pence to then come out and come around to that and say, all right, now I'm going to be number one. It's I, I don't know what his argument is. Right. So where's where's your path to saying right. I can be elected and I'm going to stand up and fight when most Republicans look at Mike Pence for right or wrong, but there's a lot of Republicans right now who look at Mike Pence and say, you didn't stand and fight on January 6th, that you said that you were going to fight these things. You came to, and I've got him on video. He came to one of my events at Turning Point USA in December of 2020. And he said, we will fight these ballots and we're going to go with this. And I'm, no, I'm not even making the argument, but he said that he would fight and then he didn't. And so it felt like a loss of credibility on his part when he was making all these noises, make, sending all these signals like he was going to fight, like he was going to send things back to the states, that slates of electors would be questioned, or at least that there'd be some debate. And, and it just didn't happen. It didn't happen at all. Uh, Ronald Reagan very famously had an 11th commandment, which is thou shalt not speak ill of your fellow Republican. Uh, that seems to have gone completely out the window in the last couple of years, especially I, I'd say since January 6th. Uh, it's really become uh, almost like a circular firing squad in Republican politics and also maybe on the right in general. Uh, do you think that this is a healthy thing? Do you think this is an unhealthy thing? Do you think this is inevitable? Well, you know, I actually think that that commandment died in October of 2015 when yeah. at the Reagan Library when they and I know people have been playing this clip a lot lately, but I, I never forgot it. But 
when they asked all the candidates in that on that stage, they said, will you would any of you not support the Republican nominee when they if they win? And Donald Trump was the only one that raised his hand. And the only one telling the truth. Because a lot of them had no intention of supporting right. Trump as the nominee. Of course not. Of course not. And we all knew it. And the minute that he's and he gets booed, remember he gets booed yep. initially when he does that. And then he makes that he makes that classic response where he kind of just does the you know does the the grimace where he's like the smirk you know really <laughs> like really the and he kind of points to the rest of the stage and everybody just loses it. Everybody just loses. It. I think I can't remember if it's Megan Kelly or not who who's the the moderator of that or maybe it was Tapper. Um, but the minute he did that, it put himself over with the it did two things. It put himself over with all, with a huge swath of the electorate, but it also bifurcated the Republican Party into almost two parties. And it set up a situation where here's a guy that's saying, I'm part of something different. I'm part of something that's outside that machine, that old boys club, those guys who are going behind the scenes and they're just going to screw you left and right. And Paul Ryan walking around saying, yeah, look, I know you you paid into Medicare, Medicaid and Social Security your whole life, but now you're not going to get any of that back. And look, you know, you can talk government, the solvency in the program. Like, I get it. I, I get it. But if you're of that generation, just just politics, right? If you're of that generation and you understand that you had to pay that and every way, every week, or every two weeks when you got your paycheck, it said Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security was taken out. You were promised that you would get that money back at yeah. some point. And so this was done to you by the government. It was not your choice. And so you can find the most rock ribbed Republican, Trump supporter, you know, two A, loves Ted Nugent, whatever you want to say, right? And they're gonna they're gonna go. They will lose their absolute minds if you tell them that they can't get that money. They have no access to that money. They will absolutely lose their minds. And so for Republicans out there to be campaigning this way i think it's just it, it, it's politically um it's it's like politically uh, ignorant just completely com incredibly completely ignorant tone deaf of to what's actually been going on in this country and telling people that like well we can see that affirmative action is going on well we can see uh money is being spent on this group and that group and every single group under the sun well all of these guys are getting all the banks are getting bailouts so, you know all these the defense contractors are all getting money but that money that we promised to you that we took from you every week no you're not actually going to be getting that you'll have an actual revolution on your hands and so it doesn't surprise me that paul ryan and mitt romney uh didn't get elected and went down in flames i didn't vote for them or mccain um, I thought I didn't vote for Obama either. I actually wrote my dad in. And that this idea that you're going to go to the electorate and say things like this, it's it's hilarious. So what we have right now is you actually have a viable third party in America today. It's called MAGA. It's or America First. They're, they're kind of um, uh, mutually interchangeable. It just happens to reside within the Republican Party. Um, what do you think of uh, whether his Trump, one of the issues that he's always hit at with the corporate press is his insistence that um, the 2020 election was stolen from him. Carrie Lake made this a central or was portrayed as at least making it a central part of her campaign for a governorship in Arizona. She's been on this show a couple of times. She's currently fighting, uh, I think it's yep. up for appeal, uh, the election results in Arizona. There's the question of whether it's true or false, but there's also the question of, is it good strategy to harp on this point? Something could be true and yet still talking about it might be very bad strategy, as we all know, uh, with many political issues. What are your thoughts on 2020 and how that affects his path going forward? Well, I certainly think 2020 was a joke. Um, I'm definitely more in the camp of saying that, um, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If these if these laws have been passed in states for ballot harvesting or whatever, you you know, whatever a certain state might call that then guess what you know that's the tactic you have to adapt to because if you don't have control of the levels of levers of power then it doesn't matter what your opinion on the issue right. is you either have to you you have to adapt to that tactic or or you're just going to get blown away by it you're going to get absolutely blown away and you saw this in orange county california where this was happening which has always been a traditionally red part just just south of, south of uh, los angeles hard red this is where goldwater red. got launched yeah, yeah this is goldwater this is like there's a there's a there's a ton of republican money in there the donors etc and suddenly it, it flips blue in 2018 and people are saying what's going on what's happening this was like our one you know our one spot mccarthy his district's not far from there and they realized it was because of the California ballot harvesting law. Well, the people in Orange County, they didn't they didn't complain about it. They didn't whine about it. They got together and they said, all right, 
So if ballot harvesting is the rule now, if that's the norm, if you set the new standard that that's the norm, then we have to do this. There were pastors that were putting ballot harvesting drop boxes in the back of their churches and evangelical pastors and people were coming up and they were sued. The state tried to sue them. The, the, the Democrats tried to sue them, Mark Elias, et cetera. They, the whole, the whole nine yards, the whole machine, but they couldn't do anything about it because it was, they, it was, they were following the exact same laws that they had written. And so, and, and by the way, the idea that churches wouldn't be, you know, it's not a viable voting center, excuse me. We've had, we've been voting in churches for as long as the United States has existed, probably even prior to the United States existing. I mean, that's, that's just a joke. And so when, when you look at, if you're, if you're, and by the way, this doesn't, doesn't matter who the nominee is uh, going forward that it, you know, it, I, I do think the nominee will be Trump, but I also think it doesn't matter. So if you're in one of these states like Pennsylvania, like Michigan, like Wisconsin, um, that you need to win Georgia, Arizona, the Kerry Lake, that if this is the norm, then guess what? You have to adapt to the new norm. You just do. And you have to put money behind that and you have to get, you have to stop complaining. You have to stop whining. It's, um, and look, I, I'll just, I'll just be honest. I said this to the president. I said, I said, Mr. President, if they bring 2000 mules, we bring 10,000. What do you, what are your sources telling you? Cause you probably have better source than anyone I know in DC about how good or bad Joe Biden's state of health, both physical and mental is because being the president, listen, even if, yeah. you, if you or I were the president, it's not going to be a cakewalk. It's going to be absolutely devastating. It's, it's extremely excruciatingly tough job that i mean it's it, it, he's barely involved okay. is from what i hear is that a lot of this stuff it's like you look at the foreign policy and it's all victoria newland right so victoria newland setting the policy and then tony blinken and jake sullivan and kirby just kind of go out and, and say what's going on i and and you see this with biden and they they'll send him on these like little junkets like he goes up to canada he hangs out with with allegedly goes up to canada which we're by the way i don't know if you've been following that i'm we're i'm actually calling into question the existence of canada lately um <laughs> it's kind of interesting how all their cities are right next to america maybe that's just where america ends and and then of course biden um makes that makes his faux pas of saying i'm sorry i'm very happy to be here in china i mean canada oh really oh really <laughs> So yeah, we'll, 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 the jury's out on Canada, but there's, there's this idea that, I mean, a lot of this administration is just being run without him at this point that, you know, he goes up there and you know, the, you know, what is it? The, um, um, the Tetrarch or, you know, the guy from, from Ireland comes over, um, it's what they call their prime minister for, yeah, yeah. for Patrick's day. And, you know, he, he has these like nice little meetings or they put him in with, with Olaf Scholz from the chancellor of Germany. But this idea, he's not actually running much of the white house at this point he just isn't um do you think that there's any chance that kamala harris is going to get dumped from the ticket i don't think they can honestly at this point um there were so there was talk of that and this this huge and, and we reported on it at human events daily very extensively we used to call it the um the shade war and we do we would do shade war updates between her and biden and there was this idea that uh you know that Biden was dump putting all the failures on her, that she was dumping back, that they would try to they would give her all the no win, you know, sort of issues. They said, well, inflation is going to be a Kamala thing, and immigration, and the border, and foreign policy. Remember, it was it was Kamala Harris that flies to Germany for that security meeting one week before the Russian invasion, and said, "We absolutely hold firm to Ukraine becoming a member of NATO." And, and then, of course, this is what the Russians have been saying all along was their causes belli, that their reason for going to war yeah. was this NATO. And then she just walks right into it and basically telling them, like, we're, we're not going to listen to you whatsoever. That's Kamala Harris diplomacy. Um, that being said, I think as far as 2024 goes, I think that they are going to prop Joe Biden up on a stick if they have to, to keep him up there. Because and let's just be honest, there's a lot of people in the United States who their view of him was formed during the Obama years. They remember him yep. as sort of like Obama's wingman. They might remember him, you know, his name kind of being around there from being in the Senate. And they remember him generally as like being a good guy who was in the room. And, you know, he's, he's a yeah, great team example player. of the Peter principle. He's a great example of yep. that if you just wait around to be picked long enough that eventually you will be. And for people, they, they kind of have, it's, it's harder to attack. And this is something I would say to Republicans. Um, regardless of which campaign it is, it is much harder to attack Joe Biden than it was Hillary Clinton, because Hillary Clinton just inherently 
uh, reviles people. She just, she, she makes you have this visceral reaction. She's like, <laughs> they were like, what did they say? Um, she's, she's everybody's first wife, you know? And America's uh, mother-in-law is what I called her. America's yeah. mother. Yeah. America's mother. That's a good one. And, um, uh, sorry, sweetheart. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, this, uh, this, this idea that Biden is going to be so easy to attack. I think that's something that Repu Trump certainly found that out in the first debate. Uh, um, I think that yeah. Republicans really need to wise up to this, that people kind of view him as like a kindly old grandpa. They view him as an old uncle. Everybody knows a family member or has had a family member that's kind of gone through, you know, those 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 later stages of old age. It'll happen to all of us. And I think there's a lot more sympathy for Joe Biden than a lot of people realize. There are certainly a lot of your your typical Republican consultant realizes that you just can't attack him the same way. But that being said, I think one of the more effective responses to Biden wouldn't necessarily be to go after him personally. And certainly when he makes his gaffes and foibles, you just you have to play that over and over and over. You, I, have a, I have a meme. It's like, um, how, uh, you know, the number of days, number of days since Biden fell down again and it just always goes back to zero. <laughs> fell up. It's it's you it's know Lenny. You're, you know, when you're falling up <clears throat> the stairs, he is falling up. He, is, he seems to he seems to fall up. It's a, oops, I became president. Yeah, and the 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 way to do it though is to say, look, this guy's Jimmy Carter, right? This guy, yeah. this guy's Carter. Where where people don't necessarily have a negative view of Jimmy Carter. I'm talking about the the population writ large. You know, America doesn't hate Jimmy Carter, but America in 1980 kind of realizes that realized that he wasn't the guy for the job. And, you know, with the exception of like my liberal neighbor who comes up to me yesterday and go, everything, everything is a conspiracy with my liberal neighbor, by the way. So it's, hey, you know, all the prices are up at the supermarket, right? I said, well, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of that going around. And I just, you know, I, I try not to get into it because you know, we live next to each other. And, and he goes, he goes, well, you know, it's all the price gouging. I'm like the price gouging, <laughs> the, the gouging. Like you really think that these like these like struggling convenience stores are gouging their customers and like go, everyone's going out of business because of price gouging this idea that so inflation doesn't exist. It's all price gouging. It's all business. It's all. And that's where I'm like, I'm like, I just want to I want to bring out my um, <laughs> my Mises and just like smack. Him yeah, in the how face is with price it. gouging even possible in a free market? If my if I'm it, a convenience store so and I make my gum $50 right. a pack, right. I, no one's paying 50 a pack. It's it's no you'll go to the you'll go to the guy across the street you'll go across the street who has it for twenty five and I was like great I'm I'm getting all all this guy's business of course that's not what's going on I'm like why did the coffee shop close down then because they couldn't afford rent it's like well that's just more price gouging and it's like they have these these it's 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 thought stopping cliches yes and it's thought stopping cliche and I think James Lindsay actually came up with that so I'll, I'll give him credit on that one where it's like the word racism it's like the word bigotry it's like the conspiracy, word, the theory. conspiracy theory far right um and and it's it's a false because right you know that's a price that's price gouging that's not actually happening whereas if you actually dig into any of this it's you know you can always unwrap it but how many people are actually paying attention to that how many people are going to take that time and tie that to the fact that everybody has the right to vote if you're if you're over 18 and can fog a mirror and you have committed a felony so guess what like that's the situation we're in and i think a lot of republicans need to understand that um jack we're running out of time what has been your favorite part of this interview? Um, it was the part, it was actually before the interview. It was interesting where- That's not what I asked I, you. Stick to the when question, I, when I, sir. No, because, because no, when I woke up this morning and you were just like in my room, like watching over me. And I thought, this is nice. Michael is making sure that I'm safe throughout the night in my slumber on my MyPillow. Sweet dreams. All month long on Pluto TV, stream the biggest Tyler Perry movies free. Watch your favorites like Medea's Witness Protection and Medea's Big Happy Family. Join Tyler Perry as he goes on a couples retreat with Sharon Leal in Why Did I Get Married? Or Idris Elba and Gabrielle Union in the Tyler Perry directed film Daddy's Little Girls. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows available on live and on demand. Download the free Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in, watch free.